leading on uh, uh, community uh, organizing in the Bronx and in other parts of the state, uh, building strong chapters that are rooted in shared struggle and solidarity around issues of housing, of education, et cetera. And we're very excited to have them uh, here in this conversation. Um, and so just to orient people a little bit, this is a Zoom webinar. So it's a little bit, you know, we've gotten quite used to Zoom in quarantine. Uh, so it's a little bit different than uh, Zoom. Um, uh, but there's a Q&A function, so feel free to get your questions in throughout the discussion. There's also a raise hand function at the bottom of the screen. So when it comes time to Q&A, we can ask folks to use that. And so uh, before we introduce uh, our guest who's waiting very patiently, uh, we're going to be joined by a variety of people on this call who really represent the breadth of our coalition and the vision for the kind of leadership that we need, right? Labor, community, individual activists, faith-based, et cetera. We need a strong and robust movement to deliver the type of world that we know that we all deserve. And so we're excited to have this conversation with Jamal, who himself is very community grounded, um, to kind of kick off the kinds of conversations that he will be having when he wins, right? When he comes back to community and he comes to meetings and he says, uh, how do you all feel about housing or the healthcare crisis? How do we govern together? How do we move each other forward? And so his community organizer mindset is very much why we're so excited about his leadership. And these types of forums are the places and the spaces that we will try to continue to create. So this is our kind of a first virtual and public one uh, that we wanted to kick off. Uh, later in this evening, we're gonna be joined, or soon we'll be joined by two of the kind of shining lights in the Bronx, two progressive champions, Senators Gustavo Rivera and Alessandra Biaggi, who are also WFP champions, and we'll talk about governing together at the state and federal level. Um, so thank you all for joining us. I did want to thank the organizers of this call, um, Michelle Krenzel from the Nurses Union, Sharon Cromwell from the Working Families Party, um, and Juanita from uh, CVH Power, uh, who have you know, put together this event with a real labor of love, and so thank you all for doing that. So for those of you who don't know Jamal, um, we actually want to share his video because it's an incredibly compelling closing statement before he introduces himself. Um, not everyone may have seen his latest campaign video. And so Jamal is a parent. He's a celebrated educator. He's an activist. Um, he started a school right here in the Bronx that centered holistic learning, that centered love, that centered culturally relevant education all the things that we as parents can only hope our kids are surrounded by every day and really showed the intersection of community organizing, constituent services, educational justice, um, and use that to really pioneer uh, and push forward a strong justice agenda. Uh, a lot of those skills which we know he'll apply in his role as a congressperson. Um, so Sharon, can we share the Jamal video for folks? Latino. People are losing their jobs and can't pay rent while Congress bails out corporations. We need leaders who understand what we're going through. I'm Jamal Bowman, public school educator for 20 years, the son of a single mom raised in public housing. Growing up, my mother told me life wouldn't be easy for people like us. That's why I've spent my career building opportunities for families in our community. Over the last 20 years, I've mentored hundreds of kids and supported parents who had to make the difficult choice between putting food on the table, going to the doctor, and paying their rent, all while our government continues to ignore them. That's why I decided to run for Congress. I asked voters about our current representative, Elliot Engel, and I hear one word across the district absent. This is the worst crisis since the Great Depression, and people don't know where their congressman is? The truth is, he's never really in the district. He even called his home in Maryland his primary residence. He doesn't live in our community. I live in our struggles. He's taken us for granted. After 31 years of the same, it's time for a change. 
In Congress, I will fight for universal health care through Medicare for All, rebuilding our economy through millions of Green New Deal jobs, and protecting our immigrants from deportation. I'll fight to bring down the cost of rent and housing so families can keep food on the table and a roof over their heads. And unlike my opponent, I'm not taking a dime from corporations. Our grassroots coalition is doing everything it can to protect our communities in this crisis. We deserve a representative who will do the same. Vote for Jamal Bowman to be your next representative in Congress. Me chills. I love that video. Okay. Well, welcome, Jamal. Thanks for joining us. Of course. Uh, thank you for having me. That's a that's a pretty cool video. Uh, pretty nice. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Sochi, for putting this together. Uh, thank you and a huge shout out to WFP. Huge shout out to CBH and CBH Action. And huge shout out to Nizna. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for putting this together. Uh, yeah, so for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Jamal Bowman, running for Congress in the 16th District. Uh, I've worked in public education for 20 years, uh, over 20 years, actually, and 17 of those years have been spent in the Bronx. So although I'm born and raised in Manhattan, I often claim the Bronx uh, as my second home. Uh, I started my career as an elementary school teacher on 166 in Sheridan Avenue, right off the Grand Concourse in the South Bronx. Did that for about five or six years before becoming a Dean of Students at the High School for Arts and Technology. And for the last 10 and a half years, I've been a middle school principal uh, in the Northeast Bronx at Cornerstone Academy for Social Action Middle School. And to Sochi's point, you know, not only have I spent the last 20 years within education buildings, teaching our kids and working with parents, I've also done a great deal of community organizing and community work uh, beyond the walls of school. So I've partnered with organizations like the Alliance for Quality Education, uh, New York State Allies for Public Education, the Coalition for Education Justice, and many other community-based organizations to bring transformative change to the education system, not just in the city and state, but across the country. Uh, and working with these organizations helped broaden my perspective on what was possible in our public schools and really leveraging the power and the brilliance of the parents and the communities that I worked with. You know, let me back up a little bit. So after working in education for eight years and realizing how neglected and disenfranchised and underfunded our schools and communities were and feeling more like a corrections officer as the Dean of Students and as an educator, uh, I decided to do something about it. Uh, so I organized parents, teachers, and students to begin brainstorming ideas for a new innovative revolutionary public school rooted in social justice. So in 2008, I wrote a proposal for the Cornerstone Academy for Social Action. In 2009, we submitted it to the city. And in September 2009, Costa Middle School was born. And what's important is during this time in the city, Michael Bloomberg was mayor. So not only was Michael Bloomberg implementing stop and frisk policies in our communities, he was also implementing zero tolerance policies in our schools. And he was the type of mayor who was not friendly to public schools at all. He wanted to attack public schools, close public schools, attack teachers unions and open up charter schools. But we found a loophole within that context to write the proposal for CASA and open up CASA. And our mission was very simple. Use the unlimited potential of our children to transform their community beyond the walls of the school. And we were gonna tap into that unlimited potential by implementing a curriculum rooted in restorative justice, rooted in culturally responsive education, and rooted in creativity and innovation. Uh, so we've done great work as a school over the last 10 years. We've been recognized for our test score growth over the years, but more importantly, we've been recognized for our innovation. We're one of the few schools in the city where kids are learning um, computer science as early as 11 years old. They're learning how to code and do Python code in sixth grade. They're creating local farms where they're growing organic food and learning about their symbiotic relationship between them and the earth. We have a state-of-the-art recording studio in our school where our kids recorded a mixtape that's on SoundCloud right now. And if you go to SoundCloud, search Casa All-Stars, you'll find our mixtape. So it was this level of innovation that kept our kids inspired 
uh, to come to school every day and kept them doing great work. And that's why some of our students are attending some of the best colleges in the country right now, schools like Cornell and MIT. Um, but as I said, the work stretched beyond the walls of the school. And we've been able to work with parents and organize parents to increase education funding at the state level to record numbers, not where we need to be, but we've done a lot of work there to push back against the Common Core standards and how developmentally inappropriate they were uh, for kids, particularly in early childhood and to disconnect uh, teacher evaluations to standardized test scores because there was no research to support that. And when you talk about restorative justice, when you talk about trauma-informed schools, and when you talk about culturally responsive education, I'm very proud that our name uh, comes up in those conversations consistently. But we couldn't do it alone. You know, this was not me as one rogue principal implementing all these things by myself. I couldn't do it without a collaborative leadership structure that included my teachers, the parents I worked with, and community-based organizations. And it's that kind of leadership that I intend to bring to Congress. There's no way I'm gonna ask all of you to support me so I could get to Congress and do this work by myself. To transform the world and to deal with structural racism and classism and sexism and all the ugliness of the world, we all have to do it together. And my number one question is, Help, my number one statement is when I speak to experts like Gustavo Rivera and Alessandro Biaggi is help me understand this particular issue. If there's something I don't quite understand or, or I don't quite get, or if there's something that I wanna have a deeper understanding on, I go to the experts and I go to the people on the ground who are doing the work every single day. So having Sochi Lee WFP is awesome because she's that kind of person. Having over 60 endorsements from organizations like CVH Action, uh, NISNA, the Jewish Vote, Make the Road Action, um, excuse me, CBH Power, Make the Road Action, um, and so many others, you know, New York Communities for Change. Uh, those are the organizations, those are the groups that are going to come with me to Washington. We're going there together to do great work. And I want to close with this. The main reason why I started, why I decided to run for office is because I was tired of children in the Bronx and in the district dying and no one was saying anything about it. In 2017, 2018, 34 kids died within the K-12 school system in the Bronx. 17 died via suicide. And one of those suicides occurred right across the street from our school in Co-op City, where a ninth grader who was bullied in school, had no one to go to, went to the top of a building and jumped off. And in New Rochelle High School, one student murdered another student during a lunch break. One girl murdered another girl during a lunch break. And our elected officials seem to be blinded to the connection between bad policy that they support, the poverty that consistently exists within our communities, and the trauma our kids deal with. And as an educator, obviously, these issues all intersect at our schools every day, so we develop a deep, intimate understanding of them. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Great to have Gustavo and Alessandra on, and let's get the conversation going. Great. Thank you, Jamal. I think there are two things that are, are incredibly exciting about your role. I think one is movement people right here, you know, labor, et cetera, we're always training and developing leaders to take on greater roles of leadership, right? And to have community leaders come out from movement with a clarity, right, with a mission that comes out of real conversations, stories, lived experiences, like those are the pipelines that we need to be creating all over our state if we really want to transform our political landscape. I think the second thing is that you know, education justice, people see us as, as a siloed issue, right? But schools are a site to see all of our intersecting crises, right? From food insecurity and poverty, right? To inadequate or segregated housing, um, to over-policing. And uh, that vision and that viewpoint as an educator, as a community leader, especially in um, an under-resourced community is the type of leadership that we need. And so I'm very excited about that. Um, and so, you, um, you know, we've talked, Senator, uh, Senators Gustavo Rivera and Senators uh, and Senator Alessandro Biagio are going to join us um, to really have a conversation of what does governance, progressive governance at multiple levels mean, right? Our champions in Albany, our champions in DC need to have that shared North Star. And we're really um, proud of the Bronx leadership of um, uh, Gustavo and Alessandra. And so um, they've been really championing issues that are close to us. So I want to uh, bring them on uh, to the stage. 
to our virtual stage here. Uh, we're excited that the, our movement for Jamal has been has been growing and really by true uh, by true Bronx progressives. Can, so, can I do? Can I say something real please. quick? I mean, so in 2018, you know, Congresswoman Ocasio Cortez, you know, she won her seat from Joe Crowley. In 2018, Alessandra Biagi beat Jeff Klein. And Ooh, way, way back in the days, what was this, 10 years ago now, Gustavo? Was it 2010? Go ahead. Stay off my lawn. First. <laughs> <laughs> Stay off my lawn. But, yes, it was 10 years ago. Go ahead. So, so Sochi, it's just, it's amazing how, like, Gustavo might have been the, the, the levy, right? The levy that broke things open, not just in the state, but across the country. And, like, I, I'm getting goosebumps because we're, like, living through tremendous progressive change that will redefine the Bronx and the state and the country potentially for decades to come. And, you know, I see people resigning from positions in the Bronx and deciding not to seek reelection and mm. all this stuff is happening. It's like, wow, like, okay. And you got people like Gustavo and Alessandra in place and Ocasio Cortez and hopefully me. I mean, this is really exciting. Sorry. So can I, I, can I, I say something that. real quick? So you yes. said, I gotta say something real quick. So I am, exceedingly glad that folks like AOC and Alessandra and very soon you are going to be by my side because even though I've had good colleagues in the Bronx, many times I felt, you know, here I'm going to show my age. See, you're talking about how old I am. I'm going to tell you how old I am. Remember that White Snake, White Snake song? Here I go again on yes, my yes, own. Yes. So I have felt many times <laughs> Like I'm going, going down the only road I've ever known, like that type of stuff. So I am very glad that I am being joined by champions like Alessandra, like AOC, and like you very, very soon. So just want to yeah. down there. stay off my lawn. All yeah. right, got you. Yeah, but that vocal range, that was pretty good, Gustavo. That was pretty no, good. That don't was get him started, answer. please. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't cheat. No, no, no yeah. I'm not going to say again. But I'm, so I'm going to introduce our guests, our WFP <laughs> champions, uh, senators from the, um, from the Bronx. So uh, Senator Gustavo Rivera represents the 33rd Senatorial District. He's chairman of the New York State Senate Health Committee. He's been pushing against health inequities, resisting cuts, and we've been seeing cascading cuts in the moment of pandemic and crisis um, yep. to hospital funding. He's been advocating for healthcare for all before it was cool. Um, he's been a key leader in pushing to tax the rich and support transformative bail reform and tenants' rights legislation. So we're excited to have him on. Uh, and as, as Jamal mentioned, you know, Senator Biagi is part of the wave of WFP champions when seated corporate Dems, right? Trump Democrats. Uh, and she's been an unrelenting, uh, sharply focused, deeply vocal advocate for women's rights, for budget justice, for housing and immigrant and workers justice, for criminal justice reform. And we're really excited that this is that this is our team. So she was the tip of the spear. She was the tip of the spear in 2018. <laughs> we didn't get if we didn't cut the head of the snake. It's still be, got it. It would got still it. be full okay. up and around. And we cut the head of the snake. Thank you for nice. that. Nice, nice, awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna jump in, Sochi. Go for it, Jamal. Okay, so Gustavo, I'm gonna start with you. I'm interviewing yeah, what you. What do you now. want, man? What's up? So, so Gustavo, you know, yeah. I support Medicare for all, right? You know, at the federal level. Yes, sir. Universal health care, single payer system, where the wealthiest nation on earth, no one should die because they don't have health care, right? That that's common sense. Absolutely. We need to invest in health care a lot more than we invest in the military industrial complex. And I didn't I don't know if you know this, but we actually have more nuclear weapons in this country than hospitals. So that, that just tells you how like off the chain our entire political system has been. Mm -hmm. So my question for you is this, yeah. you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has made it clear just how important it is that every New York has healthcare and that our hospitals have the resources, staff and equipment to provide comprehensive patient care. What do we have to do now to make that a reality in New York? Okay. So the, I didn't know that fact, by the way, about that factoid about nuclear weapons and, and, and hospitals. That's just bananas. But what can we do in New York? Well, uh, I think that one of the first things that we need to do in New York, and just to back up for a second, the, the crisis that we face right now, the COVID-19 crisis, and then on top of that, what has exploded after the murder of George Floyd, both of those things are kind of one on top of each other and demonstrates so clearly all of the broken places 
in our, in our social net, right? All of the places, all the injustice has become clearer. When many of us have been able to see some of them so very clearly, now it is plain for anybody to see, right? Mm -hmm. And so around healthcare, one of the things that we can and need to do in the state of New York is we need to pass the New York Health Act. And the New York Health Act would create a single payer system in the state of New York, which means if we start from the concept that healthcare is a human right, because regardless of your age, your gender, your wealth, your immigration status, if you are a human, you go get sick. And, you, and, and whether you get healthy or not should not depend on whether you are wealthy or not. So we need to move away from a system that has the market mentality at its core. And for, to do that, in the, in the state of New York, we have a piece of legislation to be able to do that called the New York Health Act. Now, let me be clear. If we are able to achieve this at the national level for every American, I'll be the first one to print out the long bill that I have, and I will dance with it while slipping, while, while ripping it up. I will dance down the street with it if I need to, if we pass it at the national level. I would too. B.I.G. knows. I would actually do that. I would actually do that. But... But we don't, but, but because that is unlikely to happen, even with champions in Congress like you, because of the difficulties in the Senate, because of the resistance of some of people in our own party who do not believe that such a thing is possible, who do not believe that such a thing is necessarily what we need to do right now. Um, I believe that in the state of New York, not only do we have an opportunity to do it, we have an obligation to do it. So I will just say that that is one of the first things that we could do here and we can pass the New York Health Act, and it is complicated, both technically and politically, but absolutely essential. And, and, and I will say, and I will challenge our governor, nobody else, nobody, everybody can sit on the sidelines if they need to, but I will say this for anybody who's watching. Our governor's saying that he wants to reimagine hmm. New York. He wants to reimagine policing. He wants to reimagine healthcare. All right, I got an idea, bro. Let's reimagine healthcare by securing it and guaranteeing it for every New Yorker. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. I challenge you to do that. And God bless. I will call it the Andrew M. Cuomo. Is that his middle initial? I don't know. The Andrew Cuomo Health Act. If he signs it without changing it tomorrow, I will change it and I will give him all the damn credit. Let's get that done. So that's one of the things that we could do in the state of New York. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sochi, I can jump in with a follow-up before going to Biagi. <laughs> That cool? Yeah, let's do it. You're the, bo you're the boss. Uh, so, Gustavo. Yeah. Tell me about, can you speak to all of us about the power of private health insurance companies and how they dictate or drive why these decisions don't, what you're saying is common sense, right? And when you center human rights in everything that we, you do, which I know you do and I do, yes. why doesn't it get done? Talk about private health insurance companies, their power, and how they influence why, they, why this stuff doesn't get done. At the core of the current health insurance system in the state of New York and in, in the entire country is the market mentality. Now, the idea that if you need to transport yourself from point A to point, actually, no, this is a better, this is a better example. It's like Yeezys. You know them ugly ass shoes that Kanye sells, right? They, the new versions, whenever they come out, they are rare, they're expensive, you gotta know the right people to get to it. And unfortunately, we treat healthcare as if though it were a pair of Yeezys. If you have enough money, if you know the right people, if you go to the right places, then you'll be fine. Then you will get access to that healthcare. We gotta go away from that. And at the center of it is the market mentality, the idea that insurance companies, because let's be clear, insurance companies are in the business not of providing care, they're in the business of making money. And the way they make money is by denying care. If you are insured, that does not guarantee that you will get health care. That is, the fact is that they keep an entire, you know, army of people whose job it is to talk to your doctor and to talk to hospitals and to deny, to obfuscate, to throw, you know, uh, obstacles in your way so that they don't have to pay. They make up the network of doctors that you can use. You can be insured, you can have a great insurance and have a great doctor, and then from one day to the next, without your knowledge or involvement, that doctor's no longer in the network. You ever heard of a formulary? A list of drugs that is maintained by the insurance company to say what they're gonna cover and what they do not. 
Your doctor doesn't have a way to determine what's in the formulary or not, neither do you. So there might be a drug, there might be a, a medicine that's keeping you healthy, and from one day to the next, the insurance company can make a decision that it's no longer there. The notion that we are, that some people that are opposed to this idea of single payer system or universal healthcare talk about we're gonna get choices taken away. That is a very nice marketing strategy that does not talk about the reality. You don't have choices now. Your choices are taken away from you because ultimately you're not the one that makes a decision about whether you get care or not. And your doctor doesn't make the decisions either. So we need to take that and strip it away. We need to take insurance companies out of the business of, of providing health insurance. Because again, they're not in the business of providing care, they're in the business of making money and denying you care so that they can maximize their profit. That needs to go away. Wow. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you for that breakdown and understanding of what's happening on the New York level in terms of healthcare. Sochi, we're gonna transition now to, con uh, I was about to call her Congresswoman Biagi, uh, uh, State Senator Alessandra Biagi, who can become Senator, Con whatever she wants when she's ready. But uh, State Senator, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm very happy to be here. And every time I hear Gustavo talk about the New York Health Act, I actually learn something new each time. That's awesome. really interesting, Gustavo. You should, you should talk more about that piece of it, that, that slippery marketing aspect, because that's very compelling, because I don't think people even know the current situation that they're in. Will do, sister. Private health insurance, slimy, slimy people, slimy, slimy part of the, of the system. So, uh, uh, Senator, um, you have uh, been a champion for and fighting for budget justice uh, throughout your time in the state Senate. I'm sure you've had an interest in this issue uh, even prior to uh, joining the state Senate. Can you uh, just enlighten us and inform us uh, about the aspects of your fight for budget justice in New York State? I would love to do that. And I'm also so happy to be here joining the conversation with you, with Sochi, with, with Gustavo, with the WFP, with Nizna. Um, this, is such a, this is such an exciting time to just really um, double down on what Gustavo said. Um, this has been an interesting experience um, a first term state senator in the legislature with this whole new wave and class and energy of people coming in, galvanizing people in the streets to vote, to care, to think about state government. Nobody thought about state government. It was like the thing that you turned the channel through because you were like, that's very boring. Thanks a lot. Now we're bringing the energy. But what is very clear is that even though we are transforming Albany, there is so much more to be done. And the budget is like the exact place where if we don't pull that lever down, we're not gonna see the transformational change that we need. And so, listen, when we entered into the budget this year negotiations, we entered into it with a $6.1 billion deficit. All right, let me just put some perspective here. It was March, we started talking about the budget. When you compare New York, because I always do, to California, California had, a, a, I think, a $20 billion surplus around the same time that New York has a $6.1 billion deficit. Why? Because we have lived for the past decade under an executive branch of government that has really focused on austerity budgets, on cutting things, on making sure that we weren't, quote unquote, overspending which is ridiculous if you actually know the details of the budget because so much of what we care about when it comes to education, when it comes to affordable housing, when it comes to healthcare, have not been funded. So for the past decade, we watched as hospitals were closed, as ICU beds were actually eliminated, 20,000 ICU beds have been eliminated um, under this current administration, while we have our public schools that are not fully funded, which, you know, when you look at the whole state budget, it's about $173 billion, okay? It's a lot of money. New York is also one of the largest economies in the world. But when you break it down and you look at education, education has about, you know, a, couple, a, a little over a billion, depends upon what, what you're looking at, right? But public schools are owed, this is an undeniable fact, over $4 billion in funding. And it's not something that's a suggestion or that advocates are just fighting for because they believe it's the right thing to do. It actually is rooted in our 
legal system because a court case decided that the public schools were owed money from the state of New York. Well, the state of New York has not made good on that promise. And so when we look at the budget document as a whole, the budget document represents our values. Where you put your money is, is where you value things. And so if we value education, if we value healthcare, if we value all the things that we're talking about tonight, then we would actually invest in them. But what we have seen in the state of New York for at least 10 years is a divestment in all of the things that we know actually allow for people to not only succeed, but to pursue happiness, right? Because I'm not interested in being here simply to allow people to, you know, just to get by. We need to make sure that everybody has more than what they need, has enough and then we can allow them and, and enable them to actually pursue happiness. So when we went into the budget this year, so many of us were basically banging the drum of budget justice because we know that there's so much money left on the table every single year by those who just don't pay their fair share. And so I'm going to run through, there's about 14 ways that we can raise revenue in the state of New York, but I'm going to run through some of them that I think will touch on um, or, or at least pull on some of the heartstrings of those who are tuning in right now. A billionaire wealth tax, I mean, New York State has, I think, 123, between 123 to 128 billionaires. That's insane, okay? <laughs> like, think about that. And they're not taxed their fair share. And by the way, the billionaires as well as the ultra millionaires during this pandemic have only profited more, right? I'm calling them the, pan the pandemic profiteers. I can't coin that on my own, unfortunately. That's a Mike Kink um, original. But it, that's what's happening here because the rich are getting richer no matter what. And so these are two examples, but let me give you another example that would kind of, you know, make our minds explode. Making sure that we are taxing yachts and jets, right? So a tax on privately owned yachts and jets that are worth, that are worth over $235,000 are not taxed in the state of New York. This is just like, this is ridiculous. And honestly, it's, in my opinion, it's negligent. Why it's why I believe it's now criminally negligent is because that six point one billion dollars has now ballooned into almost twenty billion dollars in the state of New York, and not on its own, but because we are still going through a pandemic that has basically gutted every social system and backup system that we had, even if we had only a small reserve. And so to continue down this road where we are just continuing to cut money towards education and social services while also increasing budgets to the police, increasing budgets towards things that just make no sense by allowing corporations and the ultra wealthy to continue to profit is not the way that we will transform New York. And so the fight is a very long fight. However, we're not alone. So for anybody who's wondering, well, like, you know, now what? There are ultra millionaires in the state of New York, okay? They call themselves the patriotic millionaires who are actually asking to be taxed because they understand that not only can they, but that they should be because they're not taxed fairly according to everybody else. So Jamal, there's so much that we can do from the federal and state level, but the most important thing is raising our voices and making sure that we actually have partners in all levels of government who are fighting for the same thing because the Bronx has been hurting for a long time, and it's not by accident, it's intentional. We have some of the most powerful leaders in the borough of the Bronx, and yet it's at the bottom of the list. Why is that? I think we all know. Mm -hmm. So one quick follow-up. The governor can change this, correct? If the governor chooses to tax the rich and tax the wealthy, this would all shift. Right. That's right. So yes, that's correct. Yeah. And <laughs> he also doesn't like to tax the wealthy because a lot of them are his donors. You know, you can have wealthy donors. There's nothing wrong with that, but you got to make independent decisions. Your job is to represent the people of the state of New York. Period. period. It means making decisions that are the best for them, not decisions that are the best for the 1% who already, no matter what, are going to be fine, right? They're not in a situation where they have to worry about paying rent or about a sick parent or about retiring or not or, or being food insecure. And so our governor has a huge amount of power. Um, it's part of the reason why I introduced a bill to, it's a constitutional amendment. Gustavo is a, um, is a co-sponsor on it to overturn a court case. I am. The governor so much power. Silver v. Pataki. If you don't know Silver v. Pataki, please Google it. 
take a look. It's why when we go into that, those budget negotiations, the legislature does not have co-equal power like 49 other states. Think about that. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, I think that's right. And we, we've seen is that um, taxing the rich their fair share polls incredibly well, right? It's entirely a question of political will. It's entirely a question of entrenched or special interests. And in this moment, especially of crisis, when we're asked to tighten our belts, it's especially important people push through and say, well, is everyone tightening their belts? <laughs> uh, well, you know, who is actually absorbing most of the risk and the greatest burden in this, in this crisis? And so um, this leadership and really being sharp about this issue is especially, uh, especially important. I want to ask just one last question before we bring in some of our uh, community leaders. Um, for us, I think the relationship between our congressional delegation and our state leadership is incredibly important, right? We have to have a shared vision. We have to be working in alignment. And I wonder if you two can talk a little bit about, like, what does it mean to get another progressive in our ranks? What becomes possible? Uh, what we can think about Albany and Washington uh, uniting to really make the state a place where working people can thrive. Can I start? Oh, Alexander Lees, go ahead. I can't even articulate in words for anybody who is wondering how meaningful it would be to have partnership across the state and federal level because there is virtually zero partnership across the state and federal level in District 34 where I represent. Part of that is because I'm an, I was an insurgent candidate. I came in, I took out someone that was friends with everybody, got it. The other part of that is because the values don't align. And so it makes my job very hard because any time that I take a stand for something like budget justice, like inclusivity, like racism, if anybody doesn't agree with the stand that I take, it's seen as an act of war. If we're gonna actually build the future that we need to, we need to, even if we disagree, make space for everybody to exist. And yet we have not been able to do that in the Bronx and in really in politics generally, with the exception of a, a small few of us who do it on a daily basis, but are honestly have our wrists slapped for doing it. And so it is, it is powerful, it is meaningful, and most importantly, it means that we actually can represent the people that elected us in the best, strongest, most powerful way possible. I would, first of all, ditto. Um, and the only thing I would add is that we have to look, one of the reasons why I chose to, to do this, why I chose to endorse Brother Bowman, and why I think it's so important to actually do everything in our power to make sure that he gets there, is that there has, we need to think about the world that we find ourselves in right now and what is needed right now. Um, you know, I've, I don't necessarily have many negative things to say about Elliot Engel. I don't necessarily have many positive things to say about the brother. Like he has been there and he has certainly been sufficient, um, but that is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. there, there, at this particular moment, it is necessary that we, you know, and I don't want to use a, a, a tired phrase of thinking outside the box. It's like, but we need to have people who are willing to take bold stances on issues that we have not only an opportunity, but I believe this crisis puts us in a place where we have an obligation to push for those bold changes. Now, I've been knee deep or neck deep in healthcare policy for the last couple of years. And I'll be honest when I tell you that education policy is not one of my fortes. Guess what? Jamal kind of knows a little bit about that. <laughs> and I think that he might have some very interesting ideas about not only what to do at the national level, but what to do at the state level and the city level and how to actually engage those fights to make sure that we can actually get some forward movement. So I would argue that at this particular moment where we find ourselves having voices that are willing to take those stances, that are willing to push the boundaries of what we believe is acceptable or possible, is absolutely essential because for too long, there's way too, been too many things which are broken, which are not responding correctly, which are, are leading to, to kids not getting educated, to people not being healthy, to people not having a place to live,
to people not having good economic opportunities, all of these things, we can actually tackle these together, but we need to, if we're all on the same page, and I would love to have a brother like Jamal right there with us to be like, let's go, let's move in one direction together. Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. Hope you can stay close. We're gonna bring in some of our community leaders, but then we have an open Q&A and I'm seeing a couple of good questions in our Q&A. Um, thank you both. We'll see you in a couple of minutes. Thank um, you all. Want to bring on um, some of our community leaders, uh, leaders from NISNA, the Nurses Union, and from CVH Power, Community Voices Heard Power, uh, introducing Donna St. Clair, uh, who is a nurse at Montefiore, has been a nurse for 15 years, uh, born in Grenada, raised in St. Croix, and came to New York in 2001, and now lives in my city, Money Earning Mount Vernon, Thank you, Donna, it's good to see you. Um, she's a mother of three and is currently working on a master's in policy and procedures. Um, also introducing our brother, Joseph Mupa, who is a CVH member. He's a board chair of the CVH, of CVH Power, board member of Community Voices Heard, vice president of the executive committee of People's Action, and a member of the Working Families Party, uh, regional advisory committee for New York City. Joseph, I need to understand how you balance all of this. We have to talk about work-life balance later. Um, he has over 35 years of experience in youth development and we're really proud to have him on our team. I wanna thank you both. And thank you, Don, I know you just got off of your shift. You are a hero. You're going from the workplace to the community. Oh my goodness. So thank you so much for joining us. You're we welcome. also have um, Judy uh, Sheridan Gonzalez, who's the president of the Nurses Union, um, also a, a Bronx resident that we're really excited to have on board. So welcome, Nizma. Welcome, CBH Power. Uh, we're really glad. Hey, Judy, we're really glad to have you all here. I'm going to kick it to you, Jamal. Of course. So I want to start with a question to Judy. Is, is that, am I reading this right? I'm sorry, I'm trying to Everybody follow an agenda. Or sorry, well, let's start with Donna. Let's start yes, with Donna. Donna. Yes, Donna. Yes, absolutely. Your nurse. So, so Donna, thank you for joining us. I know you just finished your shift. Really appreciate you for joining us. Uh, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you to tell us about your experience being a Bronx resident, mother, nurse, union member, and union member through COVID nineteen, and what's at stake as we start to transition into recovery. Okay. Um... What can I start as the, as she mentioned, I've been a nurse for 15 years. I have worked, um, started my career at St. Barnabas Hospital. I've moved to community health, which I've done for six years as a case manager and a home health nurse. Um, I've also moved back to the ER, which I've done for six years with Montefiore at the Einstein campus. Um, from there, I went to the clinic, which I'm currently working in ambulatory care and primary care services to the Bronx community. Um, I bought my home in Mount Vernon in 2013, and I'm raising my three kids here in Mount Vernon. And I've seen a lot of disparities mm. in healthcare, specifically with my own people. And as a nurse, I take passion in caring for that population because I've seen the disadvantage. We have a broken system that continue to break our people and it needs to be fixed. And I think in light of COVID, it exposed how broken our healthcare system is and what the desperate need needs to take place to transform our healthcare to provide access to equal quality healthcare. Um, so, I joined in on your campaign, hoping that with politicians that have a passion and have a understanding of what injustice is and why we need to fix it so that the future generation can have a better outcome. Um, I can currently tell you that working now in the Einstein emergency room, we saw the aftermath and the domino effect of closing Westchester Square Hospital. Um, when they closed Westchester Square Hospital, our census in the ER increased. With that increase in the census, we ended up having more patients waiting on stretchers for days, up to three days, just to get an ICU bed. Or when they finally got a bed, it was a hallway bed. And 
then in a hallway bed is not nice. You're basically in between two rooms. You have no bathroom outside, no shower. That care was worse to me than you would find in a third world country. COVID happened and we call it a war zone. I think nurses were working in a war zone long before COVID-19. Um, currently in primary care, we have patients that are coming in to see the doctor. That's their primary care doctor that's directing them in their care. And the healthcare is driven based on quantity. It's not quality. When a doctor is asked to see a patient in 15 minutes that may have a comorbidity of six and multiple medication that need chronic comprehensive case management, there is impossible for you to keep that patient healthy in the community with a 15 minute visit every six months. You're gonna have an increase in hospitalization. And when we continue to rip away the hospitals and rip away the inpatient beds, we are doing an injustice to the community. I had a conversation with a doctor today that I work with and he said to me, oh, we did a round rounds and we spoke about structural racism. I said, okay, we know structural racism can exist. What are the solution? And his answer to me was, there were no solution. So this is what I wanna employ the politicians. I have grown up saying I don't like politics, but becoming educated, I've realized that politics govern everything I do. And in order to get change, we have to have policies and we have to have procedures and we have to have laws that change and guarantee equal access to that healthcare. So I'm asking, because I did it in light of COVID-19, I could not go to Mount Vernon Hospital to be tested. Mm. We have had the first death in Westchester County from COVID, but we were not the first testing site. I went to Valhalla where my doctor is. Do I like going to Valhalla, driving that far to see a doctor? No, but when I go to Valhalla, I have quality care. I spend time with my doctor. We plan out our care plan. I own my health and I'm helping working with him as a team to direct my health. And that's what I wanna see the patients of the Bronx and Westchester, including Mount Vernon especially receive. And removing the hospital, removing that bed capacity where they can get their admission, that's an injustice. Putting up another ambulatory site, the people of Mount Vernon, is that necessary? Is it meeting the needs of the community? So this is why I'm employing and praying that the politicians would get the community involved, advocate. Let's not do an injustice and a disparity. We don't want healthcare that's driven in quantity and profit. Mm. And this is what's happening. It's being driven by profit. Nurses have been called the trusted profession for the last 18 years. If you want the truth, you know, want to know where to go with healthcare, ask your nurses. And that's all I can say right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can I ask you one quick follow-up question? Sure. Can you can you explain comorbidity? Can you just explain that term and, and what it means? Okay, so comorbidities will be an individual that have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and these are all the comorbidities, even obesity, that our population have been told to have a high risk of, which made us even have a poorer outcome for COVID. So if we're not teaching our population how to prevent these diseases, what are, we going, what are our outcomes gonna be? Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. our quality of life is going to be? Mm -hmm. so, and e each one of those um, comorbidities that you mentioned, each one by itself can lead to death. Correct. And, and each one on top of the other compounds the possibility of dying from COVID or just from from anything correct complications, yes it complications can, yes it can lead to heart attacks strokes you're having blood clots you're developing pneumonia your body is your immune system is already compromised and mm -hmm. now you have something else that's attacking it that's unknown and has to fight triple times as has already been doing to try and help you get a chance of surviving yeah. and many of these comorbidities are preventable they are preventable. Absolutely. You know, Sochi, just to, I just want, I know we got to move on, but I just want to make a quick connection to education. 
uh, because in 2001, a federal policy was passed called No Child Left Behind. And when that was passed, uh, states across the country began focusing on standardized tests in ELA and math only and being held accountable for standardized tests in ELA and math. Now we know ELA and math is important, but when this happened, sports and physical education were sanctioned out of the school system. So now you have children who used to get physical education every single day and had sports teams that were running around constantly every day. Now they may have gym twice a week okay. at most. And when I was a middle school principal, I shared a building with two other schools and there was one large gym and there wasn't enough space for us to have kids exercise. On top of that, we have our communities, particularly in Mount Vernon, the North Bronx and Yonkers, where people live in food deserts, mm -hmm. where they don't even have access to healthy, organic fruits and vegetables and meats. Uh, so it's not just healthcare in isolation, as we talk about. It's healthcare, how it intersects with education, how it intersects with, with food insecurity, housing insecurity, et cetera. So Donna, thank you so much for that. I do want to bring Judy into the conversation. Judy is also an active nurse and the president of the of NISNA. Um, Judy, do you want to add anything to Donna's answer? A little bit about what people are looking and facing as nurses, as as um, mothers, uh, as union members uh, in response to the crisis that we're in currently. Uh, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Am I yes. unmuted? Uh, okay. I'm having some technical trouble here. These phones are are driving me crazy. Um, so I, I think, you know, what we learned with the COVID crisis is that uh, austerity, austerity that we had that we were facing before uh, is what crippled us in order to handle the crisis. And that was built around this for-profit healthcare system, which became really clear to us when we had no ability to prepare. And, um, you know, I think I forgot, I think Jamal was saying, we, can, we can't accept, we can't accept it. Austerity is not a program. It's a death sentence. And we have to say no to austerity. This is not something we have to accept. Business as usual is not something we have to accept. Even if it helps us to survive a little bit, that's not enough. Racism is something that we don't have to accept, that we have to do something about. All, this, all these dreams that we had about changing things for the better, I think it's in our hands right now. It's in our hands when we elect people who really embrace that, that philosophy that um, we can have a better healthcare system, we can have safe staffing, that our patients can get better care, that we don't yes. have to deal with a two-tier health system uh, that uh, Donna was talking about. Donna made that really clear at a town hall at Mount Vernon where she just tore the house down talking about it. it we told a tale of two cities, it's a tale of two hospitals, a tale of two healthcare systems, a tale of two educational systems. That has got to stop and that is up to us. Uh, and the way we do that is by campaigning for progressive candidates who embrace our communities, uh, not just allow our communities to sit there and stifle and get asphyxiated. You know, we see COVID as an asphyxiating disease. Our healthcare system asphyxiates us. Racism asphyxiates us. The current system asphyxiates us. And we're saying no to that. And I hope people on this call will, will take heed and join with uh, working families and all the uh, programs and all the teams, because getting boots on the ground is how the Senator, Senator Biagi got elected, how uh, AOC got elected, uh, how, how Gustavo got elected. It's really up to us. Uh, the machine is the machine, but we are people. And this is a time for people to take charge of our lives, not let the machine take charge of our lives. So I just hope that people on this call will really take that seriously, take that personally, and get out there and, and get Jamal elected. Uh, that's what I have to add. Fantastic. Thank you. Yes, the nurses will lead and we shall follow. We're down for that. Absolutely. I think the youth, the youth shall lead, actually. Yes. <laughs> Let's bring Joseph into the conversation. Brother Joseph, how are you, sir? You're on mute, Joseph. Yes, I'm well. How are you? I'm well, I'm well. So my, my question for you, and this, this will be the most helpful question for me, uh, number one, what are you, what are your neighbors and community leaders fighting for? And how do you want your Congress member to work with you to win what you are fighting for? So right now, what we're fighting for is our very lives and our survival. We're in a situation where we see things falling apart. And we, as people of color, have been the major victims of this. We are in a battle for our own lives. 
We have come to the point where we recognize that people do not necessarily respect us or care about us. Though they speak long speeches about how much and how great this country is, we who lived in the Bronx specifically, because I, you know, I've lived in Hunts Point and every place else in the Bronx, know that it's not true. So when I speak to people, one of the things that people are feeling, they're feeling pain. They're feeling pain and they are so unsure of what it's going, of what's going to happen to them. Whether or not they're going to have a job, whether or not their hospital is going to be open, whether or not they're going to find something for the disease, whether or not their children will be able to succeed in school, whether or not they're going to be attacked by the police, whether or not they're going to be, have no house because they can't pay the rent. So there are many things which are on people's, which are on people's mind. And one of the things about Community Voices Heard, Community Voices Heard is an organization which attempts to organize people to get their voice so that they can understand that they have power, that they are not hopeless, that it is not helpless, that there is something that can do, and that there are things that we have won because we organized and got together. I want to thank you for the person that you are, for the person that you have been, for your humility, for your ability to listen to others, for your dedication. I've worked in the youth field for over 35 years and working with youth is critical. It's the key. It really is the key. And one of the, one of the benefits you're seeing is all that work that you've done and people have done in the past. You see the youth rising up and the youth shall lead and they're leading right now, okay? So we need to get our thing together and make sure we're on board too. So this also is, is a plea to everyone who's, who's on the call in terms of recognizing the seriousness of what's happening, but also recognizing that there is something that can be done, must be done, and we will do to make a change. Absolutely. Thank you, brother. Absolutely. We have a bunch of questions actually in the chat. Yeah. I'm wondering if we can transition into, into that. Joseph and Donna, that was um, fantastic and just so clear about how when our movement all leads together, um, we are just so much stronger. People really have a shared understanding of where we need to go. We just need to make sure our strategy aligns with our values and we will be unstoppable. Uh, so it's really exciting to have these conversations. Um, I'm going to just look through the questions here. Um, Jamal, so we can do, mm -hmm. we can take one. Um, I'm seeing someone is asking here. Someone is asking actually a question of why is it important? What does it matter to have a congressperson that's physically present in the district? Um, someone is, is talking to you speak a little bit to uh, the issue of absence or presence in your in the district. Yeah, you know. I don't know how anyone can can collaborate, lead, govern, engage without being physically present because through being physically present, you develop a certain level of empathy and compassion for the people that you are supposed to be serving. If you are not physically here, uh, it shows that you you don't care, number one. But number two, how, how are you ever going to have that emotional connection to the people and the struggles that they're going through? So you know, as a middle school principal, I couldn't operate my school from my home. I had to be in my school every day. And one of the things we did every day was I would open the door first thing in the morning. I would shake the hands of every child. I was present every single morning and the parents knew where I were and they could easily connect with me and engage with me and talk to me about anything that, they, anything that was going on in their lives. Uh, I would give my personal cell phone number to all of the parents in my school because I wanted them to call me if something went wrong with one of their children in the evening, instead of calling the police, which led to many evening phone calls, but also led to me helping parents find children who may have run away from home and helping them to get their children back home. So number one job of, of a leader, an elected official, someone who does community work is to show up, is to be there. And when you're there, you sh you're showing that you care and you're able to govern and write policy that's rooted in empathy and compassion and the true needs of the people because you're there not just listening to and hearing the needs, but you're feeling the needs at, the, at a deep emotional level. Uh, so you gotta show up first and foremost. Yeah, I would also ask um, Senator Biagi that question as someone who kind of toggles right between Albany uh, and the Bronx and Westchester, et cetera. Um, what kind of leadership does that demonstrate and uh, are we making too big of the fact that our congressperson is not here as much as we'd like him to be and is, as many voters are saying, actually absent? No, we are not making too big of a fact. Um, 
the pandemic is a once in a, hopefully it's once in a hundred year, but it, it could be once in a 500 year experience. Um, none of us have lived through that before. My parents haven't lived through that before. As far as I'm concerned, uh, my grandparents didn't even live through a pandemic. And so what does that mean? It means that there is a sense of fear and there has continued to be a sense of fear, right? That everybody feels from the, from all the way down in Hunts Point, which by the way, I represent Hunts Point, four generations in this district and my, my dad and his siblings grew up on Bryant Avenue in Hunts Point, all the way to the top of the state of New York. People are afraid. And so what do you do in times when people are afraid or in times of great need when you have 1.9 million New Yorkers who've lost their jobs, when you have food insecurity like I have never seen anything in my life. Like you have people who are on the verge of becoming homeless, you show up and you say, what can I do to help? Your job might not be to you know, feed people every single day, but it becomes that job. Because when you're here to serve the community, you do whatever it takes to make sure that all of their needs are met, no matter how long it takes, no matter how long you're awake, no matter what it takes, to make sure their needs are met. And so that requires you to be present because if you're not present, how are you supposed to see, to Jamal's point, where the need is or what's going on? Yes, you could get phone calls. Yes, you can get emails. It's not the same as seeing it. Let me tell you something. When you see the pain in people's eyes, it makes it very easy to act. That's called empathy. And some of our leaders don't have it. Some of them have it inherently don't need to see the pain because we already know what the pain is, but you got to show up. And that was lacking in a way I can't even, again, this is like another situation. I haven't even found the words yet to fully articulate or to share. But what I will say is during the peak of the pandemic, when we were rising up on that, on that curve, we were in a trench so deep that I could barely see left to right. And all it felt like was a conveyor belt of need and, and collapse and just sadness and fear. And if I didn't take each issue that came through as the most important one, so many people would have felt alone. I know it, right? And I'm not just talking about feeding people or helping them with unemployment. The things that people come to you with when they feel like you will hear them and you will show up for them include things like, how do I bury a loved one? In my wildest dreams, I never would have thought that I would even be involved in something like that. But that's the nature of being a public servant. It's whatever it takes, whatever the problem is, and you gotta be present in order to help out. And so, no, I don't think we're, we're making a bigger deal out of it than, um, than, than we should be. I think we should actually probably be making a bigger deal out of it, <laughs> to be honest. Also, yeah. can, I, can I jump in here for a second? Please go ahead. Two things. First, there is a balance that needs to be struck between the fact that legislators that, that legislate outside of their city, like us in Albany and folks in Congress go to Washington, D.C., there is a fact that we have to spend some time outside of our home districts. So, that, so there is a balance to be struck there. That being said, um, the, there's a dude that I defeated back in 2010, so many years ago, as I said earlier, stay off my lawn, right? Because I've been here so long. The guy that I defeated uh, served six years in federal prison after I defeated him for stealing public money. The guy that was there before him served two and a half years in, pub in, in federal prison for stealing public money. And the guy that was there before him served a year and a half for fraud. Now, why do I mention that? I have a foolproof plan to make sure that no matter how you come into this work as a public servant, you never lose your focus. This is a foolproof plan. Put yourself in front of your constituency as much as possible, interact with them on a real way as much as you can. You know why? Because when you go off to Washington or you go off to, to Albany, it, these are bubbles that are created, pardon my French, to kiss our asses, right? because we're the ones that provide or limit access to whatever it is that's up there, right? As far as resources or bills or what have you. So these are bubbles that if we go there and we stay there, then we start to just lose sight of why we do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. But regardless of who you are, I go to 184th and Valentine and Doña Juana will tell me if I'm messing up. Be like, mira, mijo, tú estás metiendo la pata. Tú no sabes lo que estás haciendo. You will have maintained that connection with your constituency. So, 
So being present in the district, and I get it, there has to be a balance, but maintaining that presence in the district and maintaining that collect connection with the people that you represent is absolutely essential. And this process is built in such a way that you can actually, if you don't keep that focus, you will lose that focus. You need to maintain that connection so that you don't lose that connection. Seems oxymoronic, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Oh, I think that's real. And I think the other thing I would add to that is for folks, you know, those of us who live in under-resourced or, um, you know, more disadvantaged communities, we only have one connection really to yeah. our elected officials, right? We don't have lobbyists. We don't have, you know, direct lines. We're not hosting public like fundraisers at our homes that give us direct contact. And if we're not seeing our elected official um, and actually have a direct relationship to them, yep. that's almost a hundred percent guarantee that our issues are not being advocated for. Mm -hmm. There are not any other conduits to leadership. And so I think yeah. that especially in the Bronx is critical. Uh, very quick story, very quick story. I got elected in 2010, right? And a couple of days, a couple of weeks after I got elected, I'm in the 99 cent store in my corner and I'm doing something. And then a guy walks by, he does a double take and just points at me and was like, wait a minute, are you, are you that dude? Are you that dude? It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm your senator. And he's like, what are you doing here? And I hold up <laughs> toilet paper. I said, uh, I poop too. <laughs> but, and, and, but that led to a conversation with that person to be like, why are you doing in this store? And I'm like, I live around the corner, bro. And that's a conversation I've had in my, in local diners, in local, the pizza shop, at the, you know, at the laundromat, at the pharmacy, just walking down the street. Like one of the reasons I love about my office, where it is in a good day, I walk to my office. It's like a 15 minute walk, but I get, I actually it takes me about 30 minutes because I bump into people who interact with me and be like, yo, what's going on? I give them my card. I'll be like, my office is over there, et cetera. That is incredibly important to maintain that connection to the district. So we have a couple of other questions. I think one is about an intersection of education and healthcare. The next is about housing. And so I think the first one I'd love to hear um, that from Donna also and J Jamal on this question. And then uh, I think Joseph uh, with CBH Power leading up health on housing. We'll get to that one afterwards. Uh, so on education, I think there are a couple of questions. I'm going to group them up. Maybe Jamal, you can start. One person asked, okay. there seems to be so few Black educators in New York City. What can be done to change that? Uh, and the other one is, could we have school nurses give students scheduled checkups to help families? Right? How, so these are both kind of connected questions. So Yeah, so the second one, hell yes, we absolutely have to do that. And I, I'll share uh, some of the things we've done in my school, uh, as well as what I want to do uh, across the country through building 25,000 community schools and, and fully investing in Title I and IDEA. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, so, so let, me do, let, me, let me start there, right? So our school, we opened in 2009. And Shortly after, we opened right around the corner from Boston Secor Housing Projects. Now, knowing my personal background, I was born and raised Upper East Side, East Harlem section of Manhattan, uh, raised by a single mom, uh, along with my three sisters. I lived in the projects, lived in rent-stabilized apartments, grew up during the crack cocaine epidemic and the AIDS epidemic. So, you know, come from a pretty, you know, pretty serious, pretty tough background. So I knew uh, when I started teaching, when I became a principal, that our kids came from tough backgrounds as well. And I was more than a teacher to them, I was like a father figure to them. We understood this. So first and foremost, we didn't hire a dean of students and an assistant principal to, to apply discipline and punitive measures. We hired a social worker and a guidance counselor to provide psychological and mental health supports and a holistic approach to how we educated our kids. We realized very quickly that that wasn't enough. Um, our kids needed additional mental health supports so we partnered with a visiting nurse service so they could come into our school two days a week, week and provide additional supports. But it seemed like over the years, the, the trauma that our kids were dealing with continued to grow. It's like we still weren't meeting their needs uh, quite enough. So we would often refer them out of the school to uh, mental health service providers throughout the district. And what we found is our, our parents and our families couldn't, couldn't get an appointment. Um, so what we began working on was a partnership between Montefiore Medical Center, which led to them agreeing to build a healthcare attachment to our school, which is not only providing health services to the families overall, but mental health supports to that community in particular. 
So we started as just a school building. We've now expanded to a community school with a healthcare facility that's open seven days a week, providing a variety of services. Um, so I've always thought, once I learned about the impact of trauma on brain development and the lives of our children, particularly in early childhood, I always had a vision for bridging the gap between healthcare and education, um, not just at the middle school level, but beginning in early childhood. So the vision is conception to career. So as soon as a, a, a mom or a family is ready to start a family, the services, the nurses, the visiting nurse services, the social workers, they're working in conjunction with educators within a community school model. So we are supporting and investing in 25,000 community schools. We're gonna fight for this at the federal level, fully funding Title I, fully funding uh, special needs services so that we can have community school models across the country. In terms of hiring black educators, we just need to hire black educators. Like it's not even, <laughs> it's not even a complicated answer. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the programs that are in place, they have these standards uh, for what, uh, what uh, students or educators need to meet in order to join these programs in order to be fast track into the classroom. And what happens is these standards are often unrealistic for many people who decide to get into education late in the game. Like for me, I went to school for business. I didn't go to school for education. Um, when I got into education, it was, a, it was easy to get a job. All I needed was a bachelor's degree. Now they got a bunch of hoops that people have to jump through and it's harder to get into the system. So they'll have like a GPA of 3.0. If you don't have a 3.0 GPA, you can't, can't get into a program to ultimately become an educator of color in the classroom. And before you say, well, anybody should be able to get a 3.0, Kind of, right? But we got to understand Dr. King didn't have a 3.0 in undergrad. So like we got to put things in perspective and it's not just about educators of color. It's about educators from the community that we want them to serve. So I didn't have a 3.0 in undergrad, but I came from the community that I wanted to serve and that helped me to be a pretty good educator going in. Um, so it needs to be like a targeted focus and it needs to, we need to take a holistic approach in terms of how we recruit educators of color as well. Great, thank you. Anyone else want to add anything to that question? For me- The educator has spoken. <laughs> go ahead, Donna. <laughs> um, I agree, I am, even with healthcare, I think it needs to be a holistic approach. Um, I think healthcare has moved where it's basically treat the disease. So we're focused on just providing care based on disease but holistically preventative health, it needs to be started in the educational system. Um, when I was in elementary school, I remember our health courses was focused on preventable. How do you eat healthy? How do you have adequate sleep at night? How, what do you need to be able to focus in class? Um, nutrition, how to eat healthy. Um, Basically, obesity, how do you avoid it? If we're teaching these things, but these programs are being depleted out of the educational system, how can we now wait until they're adults to start telling them this is what you have to do when they've been doing it from childhood? So I think health education needs to be reformed in the edu educational system also. Great, thank you, Donna. Um, we have one question on uh, NYCHA, which is a huge issue we hear on the phones, on the doors all the time. Um, so what would be your commitment to improve the living conditions of NYCHA tenants? Could you use your jurisdiction to defend the rights of all NYCHA residents? Um, or would you, I think, for instance, justify NYCHA for its mismanagement so far? Yeah, so I'm currently working with uh, grassroots organizations who are organizing NYCHA tenants to lift up their voice and fight for their rights within NYCHA. I'm also investing in or, or fighting for a homes guarantee at the federal level, uh, which is a $1 trillion investment over the next 10 years to build 12, 12 million new social housing units, uh, which will not just renovate NYCHA, but build new public housing. And the people who live within these units are, are, are living within cooperatives where they have part ownership of their home, of their land, and of the commercial real estate attached to it. Um, this is similar to Ilhan Omar's bill um, at the federal level, as well as Elizabeth Warren's bill as, as well. Um, so it's a $1 trillion investment over 10 years to build 12 million new social homes. But we're also working with NYCHA residents now uh, to organize around um, a Green New Deal for public housing. 
Um, so we talk about the Green New Deal, federal jobs guarantee, you know, ending our uh, dependence on fossil fuels, et cetera. But public housing, as we rebuild this public housing and social housing, is going to be in alignment with the standards of net zero carbon emissions. Excellent. Joseph, did you want to add something? Yes, yes, I do, as a matter of fact. So one of the things that has happened in terms of specifically in terms of NYCHA is that it was a system that was neglected so long, for so long, that it came to a point where I think one of the things we have to be mindful of is that ultimately what they maybe really want to do is just let it go, tear it down, and build something new. So we have to be on guard on that because when they tear things down, they don't necessarily replace them for us. And that's something very important that we have to remember. You know, I had one, one time I had, we spoke to a politician, I was asking about NYCHA, and he said, well, I've sued NYCHA, we can't do anything for NYCHA. I said, you mean we can put a man on the moon, but we can't fix NYCHA? Are you serious? And, that, and that's the reality. If there is the political will to do it, it will be done. If, you, if, 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 if it becomes that important, if people of color were not the majority of people that lived in NYCHA, I think NYCHA might be fixed by now. But that may be the situation that has to be reversed. And that's where we're going to look to Jamal to help us out in terms of making the reality of NYCHA to be safe, affordable, comfortable housing for all. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just, because we're a little bit close to time, I'm going to just open it up for any kind of closing remarks or statement. Um, Jamal, do you want to share something with us as we head out? And I'm going to talk to people about how they need to vote. Yes, that's what I want to share. So we're 12 days away. <laughs> we are 12 days away. We need all hands on deck. This has been an amazing experience, an inspiring experience, a humbling experience. We launched in June 2019, and now we're 12 days away, and I'm about to go to sleep, wake up, we'll be 11 days away. So it's really crazy. Um, the, the endorsements from Senator uh, Rivera and Senator Biagi have been huge. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're, we're very, very close. So if anyone wants to uh, phone bank for us, uh, tell a friend to tell a friend to support us, uh, that would be great. Uh, just so we know, I know we're talking about the entire Bronx, but our district is the North Bronx, uh, which includes Riverdale, Co-op City, uh, Edenwall, Baychester, Wakefield, Woodlawn, Olinville. Where am I forgetting? I think that's it. Um, but that's the area of the Bronx we're talking about. So if you know anyone in those areas, uh, if you could tell a family, tell a friend, tell, you know, tell, tell everyone to come out and vote and come out and support us and uh, share our stuff on social media. If you want to make a contribution, you know, $1, $5, uh, you could do that at the uh, website as well. And uh, yeah, I'm just excited. 11 days away, time to bring it home. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> you want to add anything, Gustavo, before I close out? Yeah. No. Listen, <laughs> I think that this is a very, very quickly, less than a minute. We have an amazing opportunity right now to put someone in Congress who is who will, who is willing to take bold steps in bold directions in and could be there for a while, kind of reshaping, could be a really important part of reshaping the conversation around a lot of things, but particularly education in places like the Bronx. Uh, it is an incredibly important moment. Uh, we have to take it. The possibility is there. And, you know, everybody's help. We can get it done. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Um, I really want to thank Nizna, um, CVH Power, uh, Joseph and Donna for bringing fire and clarity in their remarks, Senators Biagi and Rivera for leading with such integrity uh, and vision. Um, for Jamal for being so open uh, and clearly building your campaign and your platform based on real conversations and real stories. Uh, this will be the beginning of, we hope, a series of conversations with many of our elected champions, right? As the movement, we have to move towards governing together, towards bringing what we're hearing on the streets, on the doors, into real policy. And so these conversations are a starting place for us to do that. I'd encourage people to vote early. You can vote safely from home. Request your ballot by June 16th. Return it by June 22nd. Uh, you can also vote in person on June 23rd. Uh, this is the moment. We are in crisis. All the questions about who we are as a country, what direction we should be going in, what we want for ourselves, our neighbors, our children is on the ballot right now, right? Vote 
clearly vote for change, vote for vision, vote for the future that you want. Um, that is one of the most important tools we have in our toolbox. Uh, we should be on the streets and we should be in, uh, in the ballot box. Let's all do that together. Um, I also want to uh, encourage you to volunteer, right? We have to talk to each other and that's both formally through texting, through phone banking, either with WFP or with the Jamal Bowman campaign. That's also talking to your neighbors. I've been taking my three-year-old out with me with Jamal literature and talking to anyone, right? People are disconnected right now. Uh, people are not necessarily as, as plugged in as we usually are. We have so many things we're thinking about in this moment. Have a conversation with your neighbor. Put, make a list of 20 people you want to talk to about this campaign and work your way through the list and make sure they have a plan to vote. We are the ones who are going to get ourselves in the place that we need to be. Uh, so it takes all of us. But thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you for spending time. Feel free to drop any questions or your phone or your email address in the chat box if you want to get more information. Um, but good night, everyone. Thanks so good much. Good night. Peace nice and love. Thanks, y'all.